Hi, Sandra here, and today I am at Lauchenrad, one of my very favorite small ski domains. The two chairlifts of today's video are just meters apart, but they are from two very different eras, as over three decades separate their construction dates. Follow me on this journey through 31 years of technological evolution and be amazed by how things have changed between 1986 and 2017. You won't believe how radically some technologies have altered, while others are still pretty much done the same way as they used to in the old days. Cyril, the deputy technical supervisor of the Laugenraudbahn, dedicated almost an entire day to give me a perfectly planned and incredibly complete tour. It took me a whole two days to mentally recover from all the things I had seen and learned on that Sunday. So please fasten your seatbelts as I'm about to blow your mind with probably the most elaborate ropeway video I've ever made. The Lauchner Alp is located in Valais, Switzerland. The reason I love it so much is that despite the small number of ski lifts, the pists are diverse and full of action, and the snow is often of superior quality due to the microclimate they have in the Lurchen Valley. Also, the personnel is super friendly, which is why I had taken the courage to ask a random staff member if I could come and film. He gave me the cell phone numbers of the technical supervisor and his deputy. From there on, things escalated quickly. Remember Yannick from my What You Didn't Know About Ropeways video? Well, he had worked here in the past, so he had shared that video with the Lauchenralp staff. Long story short, when I got here, they knew exactly what I was looking for and they were 100% prepared for me coming to shoot the footage. Let's take a ride on each of these chairlifts and share some trivia about them while we're at it. The old lift was built by Garaventa way before it merged with Doppelmayr. The new lift is a model by Bartoli, a manufacturer that entered the decoupling ropeway business relatively recently. Both are decoupling ropeways and slow the chairs down at each station. Each chair of the Bartola lift holds six people and the chairs are a minimum of 47 meters apart. The maximum velocity would be 5 meters per second, however that is rarely used as the new lift is intended for skiing beginners also, so better give them more time to board and exit. This compares to the Garaventa's 3 people per seat, but the spacing of the chairs can be reduced to 21 instead of 47 meters. However, the old lift can only reach 3 meters per second when all the chairs are in use or 4 meters per second when, for example, only a third of the vehicles is on the rope. So, which lift transports more people per hour? The capacities are surprisingly close. They max out at 2000 people per hour for the old lift and 2200 people for the new lift. The experience of the ride is uncomparable though. The new chairlift is butter smooth, as can be expected from a recent ropeway. This one is the slightly older model. Now let's look at and listen to each top station. So basically the same principle as at Flushen. As the chair enters the station, it is decoupled from the rope and passes a series of tires, of which each rotates a little slower than the previous one, decelerating the seat. The chair is then handed over to a belt that slowly turns it around. Here is a closer look at the belt. The finger can flip down in case the chair does not match the belt. The newer Bartolet chairlift does not use a belt at the curve. Instead, tires go all the way around the top station. In the straight path, they are linked with belts, same as the old lift. At the curve, however, all the tires rotate at the same speed and there is an angle to cover, so these angular gears are used instead. Neither of the top stations have motors propulsing the chairs under normal operation. Instead, both take the torque directly from the rope. However, the similarities end here, as they do this in very, very different ways. 
In the old Garaventa lift, the torque is harvested at the big yellow top wheel that turns the rope around. The whole assembly is installed statically and it's fixed to the building. Switching to the portally lift. Its top wheel is not connected to anything. To find the spot where the torque is tapped, one must open these blinds. The top station's tire array is divided in two, each half being powered by its own tap reel. But what's that red line present in both chairlifts? <laughs> I suddenly remembered that I've seen this at Wildspitzbahn already, but I hadn't noticed it back then. Another shared feature are the brushes. The one of the old chairlift can even rotate. They can be lowered during bad weather to brush water off that might otherwise turn to ice on the chair's contact surfaces, causing the chairs to slip on the tires. Everything was taken into consideration, even back in 1986. At the edge of the station, the chairs are decoupled from the rope as they enter and reattached to it when they exit again. Since I've grown attached to ropeway clamps, sorry for the pun, I put in extra effort to capture the magic moment on tape as neatly as I could. Cyril's support was once again invaluable as he let me stick my small camera into small openings and slowed down the chairlift for me to get a better shot. The mildly annoyed text messages from my girlfriend confirmed that she was attempting to use the lift during this time, but the footage was definitely worth it. Sorry honey, if I could go back and undo it, I might have given you some chocolate along for the wait. So let's clamp! And now the Bartoli clamp at full speed. Is this too much coupling and decoupling footage? Should I take my obsession to a shrink? Come on, admit it. You cannot resist this splendid 90 degree coupling mechanism either. But enough now. Let's see the Garaventa clamp and hope I won't lose my hand.
Well, that also explains how the Patru Larve clam from the awesome Ropeways compilation video works. Now let's descend almost 800 meters of altitude and see the Bartolais bottom station. The power for the outermost tires is taken from the rope in the same way as on a top station. However, the tires accelerating and decelerating, as well as those in a slow section, are quite unique. The way they are built is so ingenious that I decided to make a separate video about them. I uploaded it under the impossible garaging that actually exists. Check it out, it's awesome stuff. On this video, I'll focus on the other technologies in this bottom station. The whole assembly, including the motor and main transmission, sits on a cart. This hydraulic system pulls the cart towards the bottom, keeping the rope under the right tension and adjusting as the lift gets heavier or lighter, depending on the current amount of passengers and the wind conditions. Each cylinder can pull 18 metric tons. For safety, the system is redundant. The massive electrical cables powering the motor move along with the cart. Here's my finger for scale. The smaller motor attached to the main motor drives the cooling fan. The reason this fan is driven separately and not just attached mechanically to the main motor is to avoid overheating when running on slow speeds for a long time. The main motor is an asynchronous AC motor driven by a frequency inverter which we'll look at later. The two power cables run in parallel, splitting up the massive amount of power required in two to reduce the cable diameter, as an even thicker cable would barely be bendable. Each cable contains three wires, one for each face. Following the motor shaft, we first encounter the service brake. When it is used to bring the ropeway to a stop, its hydraulics follow a computer-defined curve, precisely applying the right amount of pressure to the disc on the shaft. Das ist jetzt zum Beispiel die Betriebsbremse, die ist geregelt. Jetzt siehst du, die muss, äh, die muss mit 0,55 m pro Sekunde im Quadrat verzögern. Mhm. Und dann siehst du die Rampe, die er hier fährt, die blaue, bis er still ist. Dann haben wir eine, eine Verzögerungsüberwachung, das heisst einen roten Strich. Das ist eigentlich also wie ein Grenzwert. Wenn jetzt die Bremse mal nicht mehr in der Verzögerung sollte ich zutun, geht die blaue Linie über die rote drüber raus und sobald das an einem Kreuzungspunkt kommt nachher die nächste höher Bremse drin. The service brake is just one out of four braking modes. Two of them are electrical and the fourth one is a safety brake connected directly to the large wheel. The last part of the assembly that remains to be explained is the transmission. It reduces the motor's RPM and increases its torque, powering the big wheel directly. This kind of transmission tends to get very warm, which is why it is cooled actively using this radiator. In case of a power outage, this diesel engine connected to a hydraulic pump works as an emergency propulsion. If any American farm boys are watching, they'll love this. You're actually looking at a John Deere tractor engine. The person putting this sticker on probably had no idea that the part would go in a freaking ropeway. Love it. So in case the power fails, the tractor uh, emergency propulsion is engaged and then the diesel's engine's power is used to drive this hydraulic motor powering the wheel directly. This is only used to get the passengers off, then the ropeway is shut down. The hydraulic motor is disconnected under normal operation. Now let's get back up to compare this to the older Garaventa chairlift. The clocking here is performed entirely mechanically. As you can see, this belt has fingers that are spaced just the right way. Those fingers pick up the chair as it approaches the belt. There should be a motor, but the rope goes straight into the wall. Following the cable, we first discover the point where the energy to move the tires is harvested from the rope. Then the cable travels down into a deep, loud shaft. Also das ist ja so ein Betongewicht oder so und das Seil ist spannend. 
Climbing down the various platforms through the noise and smell of grease already feels like going down deep into a monster's cave by the lone. Additionally, the whole assembly is moving up and down softly. It's barely noticeable, but that makes the eerie feeling even more pronounced. To get me a better shot of the movement, Cyril tells the operator to stop the chairlift briefly, and when it starts back up, the monster moves noticeably. down at the lowest floor of the assembly the main motor is located. It runs on DC and is pretty much similar to the ones at Flushen, but this one is older. Built in 1986 it has 450 kilowatts, that's about 612 horsepower. To its right we have the cooling fan which also looks familiar from Flushen. The motor is then connected to the main transmission through this belt. The transmission is huge and also cooled actively. So even though the architecture of the two chairlifts compared in this video look completely different, the mechanical basics behind them are almost identical. The statement is also true for the brakes. Emergency diesel engine sits on the very top of the assembly. I sped up the recording so that you can see the assembly moving gently. The old lady is still in great shape. Hydraulic hoses carry the engine's power a floor down. These gears are then used to connect the hydraulic motors to the main wheel. This propulsion is also only used to unload passengers and then wait for the electrical power to return. The red box next to the two hydraulic motors is the hydraulic unit controlling each of the motors. All the way at the bottom of the assembly, the shaft has a door leading to a small workshop. Whoever took the time to outline the shape of each of these tools must be the tidiest person to walk this earth. The room connects directly to the garage and contains three special vehicles. The first two are used for maintenance work, the third is a test vehicle. Its clamp wheel has an insufficient diameter and it must trigger an emergency stop whenever it is put into service. This is tested once every month. This workshop is suitable for small repairs. Also, every year, 33 chairs are completely dismantled and the washed clamps are sent to Garaventa for inspection. Talking about Garaventa, the logo makes a lot of sense now, doesn't it? 
And that concludes part one of this charitive comparison. If you are wondering how all of these voters are driven, make sure to stay tuned for next week's video part two, where we are going to look at the high voltage components that deliver the power required to drive the motors, as well as the different sensors that track the chairs and possible errors throughout the stations. As a little spoiler, the technological gap between the two chairlifts is going to be much more pronounced in the next video. To be notified by YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you next week. Goodbye.